I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, looking to deepen your understanding of the Bible, but not sure where to start? Well, you can look no further than Get a Grip on the Bible, the ultimate study guide designed to provide the perfect balance of information and context, all while instilling the confidence you need to truly grasp the Word. Join us right now as we sit down with author Jerry L. Burton to discuss the inspiration behind this essential guide. We thank Jerry for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank the team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put Jerry in the spotlight today and ask viewers like you at home to support writers like him right now by subscribing to our channel. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me, Logan, and uh, thank you for Atticus for supporting me in, in this effort also. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. You've had quite a life. You and I chatted a little bit before the um, before the uh, interview. You're, you're an ordained minister and you've also been a businessman. You've also been in the military. Tell me a little bit what made you focus on the Bible for this, for your work, for your writing. Uh, I've always been focused on the Bible actually, mm -hmm. throughout all of my careers. Uh, God has blessed me for it. But this particular work came about as a result of one of the many uh, study groups I've had uh, and led. And I had a small study group going. It was brand new, new Christians. And after about a year of working with them, uh, I asked them, well, how many of you have really read the Bible all the way through? Right. And only one guy said he had. Um, uh, he had been in prison for two years. That's mm -hmm. where he was able to read it. He had time <laughs> on his hands. Yeah. Uh, he's still in. He's still in the group. In fact, I have breakfast with him every Saturday morning, and we have a real blessed time. But um, he read it start to finish, in that order. I had done that years and years ago. He and I both agreed it was the worst experience we've ever had. <laughs> It uh, Bible's just not written that way. Right. Um, I have studied it for decades. I have researched. I'm, I'm a science researcher, a business researcher. Of, um, you know, I've published in in science as well as as religion and other literature. And uh, uh, I, I just enjoy research. So yeah. this book came about because my guys told me why they hadn't read it. Mm. Why not pick up the Bible and read it? Well, it's big, it's heavy, it has print about that small, right? And it reads like a different language, and that is very true. I have never ever seen a review on the Bible that said it's an easy read. <laughs> so uh, not exactly also, a page turner, as you say. <laughs> no, it's not a page right. turner, uh, unless you understand what it is you're reading. Right. So. What I have done as a researcher is I have developed this book as not a normal study guide. It's an abnormal study guide mm -hmm. because I don't tell you what the Bible says. You need to get that for yourself. You need right. to embrace the word of God personally. That is what this book is about. It's about making it personal. And if you can give me a few minutes here to go through just the, you know, uh, and I know you've read the book and in the foreword of it, I give five steps, five or six steps about how the book is organized. Right. And, and that's what makes it different. This is a unique study guide. Uh, and I don't like study guide. It's a research guide, really. Right. Um, first of all, I do eight chapters, to, I mean, eight books, just Genesis through Ruth. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a reason for that. And I'll tell you that later. But the first thing I tell you in each chapter is I give you the background. Uh, and I say chapter, I'm sorry, book. In each book, um, I give you the background, who wrote it, who they were talking to, um, what their intent was. And um, um, the culture, something about the cultural background, the, you know, I, I embrace history and I embed scripture in history. Mm -hmm. Starts off light in this book, 
the next volume will be uh, deeper. But you have a feel for who the power players are, uh, what the culture is like, what the language is like, because Hebrew is a contextual language, mm -hmm. which means that if you have one Hebrew word to know what that word means, many times you have to find, you have to read 30 words around it to figure out how that word fits in and what it really means. Right. Greek for the New Testament is, is totally different. It is it is very precise language, more precise than English. And so you, you might misuse a word. So you have to know something at least basic about the culture, about the people, um, and certainly about God's purpose, which comes out through this, this study. The second thing that I do is I ask people to read one or two stories. And I tell them what stories. And I make sure they're familiar, easy stories. Mm -hmm. Because what I want to do is teach them to read the Bible. They can figure out what the Bible says with God's help. So they read the, the, the small, short, simple verse or story. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm hung up on stories. Storifying. That's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do. Storify your experience with the scripture. So then I ask a few questions about it uh, and explain what, you know, how it is arranged and what they should have picked up. Um, and again, it's not the meaning of scripture, it's the meaning of the writing, the mm. words. Um, then I give them a little more challenging story. And they go through the same thing, but I haven't given them the background. They read it. And then at the end, I will give them the information they should have been able to pick out right. of that story. Now they're starting to get an idea of how stories flow. You know, my, my wife, she has a PhD in uh, intercultural medical communications. Mm -hmm. uh, I can hardly get that out. She's a <laughs> beautiful and brilliant woman. And uh, she uses the term homo nerens, which means homo, of course, humans. Narrens means that, that we live a narrative life. We have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We read stories, middle, begin, or beginning, middle, and end. The Bible doesn't always do that. Right. And, and so we get hung up. We say, well, what? You know, when you get to 1 Samuel, you say, where did Eli come from? Right. Hadn't heard of Eli up until now. He was a judge. He lived at the same time Samson did. These are things that really enhance what you're reading and give you give you more of a, a feel for it. The third thing I do is I sign uh, uh, another story um, that um, they just simply have to read, and uh, that's to gain their confidence. And I ask them to be able to tell this story. Uh, and, I, and I say, you know, read it, don't memorize it. Mm -hmm. I really have heartburn with memorization of scripture, not because it's wrong, but because so many people misuse it. They'll quote a lot of scripture out of context. And, and you know, what does it mean? You need to embrace scripture. And you can do that by storifying it. So mm -hmm. you make a story, you read the story, you learn the story, you embrace the story. Uh, the way I always read and was taught to read by my mom was, Pretend I'm the lead character. Then read it again. Right. Pretend I'm one of the other characters. And then read it again as another character. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting the whole meaning of what you're reading. Right. So right. I tell these people, read, remember, uh, don't memorize it, but, but embrace the story. Tell the story to yourself in the mirror. And eventually tell the story to your mate, because they will be your toughest critic. And, uh, and roughest audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you will become not an expert at stories, but you'll become comfortable. When you give your Christian witness, the best witness you have is your story. Yeah. So you just tell, you know, tell the story to the person who's wanting to, to know about your experience with Christ. So, so this, this whole thing, even though it sounds like I start out narrow, 
it spreads out into your entire Christian walk and your entire faith walk. Um, then at the end of this series of stories, I ask a few questions and, and the, the questions are things that they're supposed to have picked up about the technique as well as the stories. So if you're using this in a, in a Bible study, um, which is fine, you can share all of these things that we're doing. Somebody read a story, somebody tell what it means, and then they can answer these questions. And then uh, uh, the last thing that I do is after those questions, which are kind of free form, I ask, what's the main thought you got out of this book? Hmm. What's the main theme that you think came, came out of this? Um, and um, then I list for every, for every book that we cover, all eight of the books at the end of the chapter for that book, I list every story included in that book. So everything in Genesis, everything in Exodus, et cetera, et cetera, through Ruth, mm -hmm. I include. And I define the first verse, which might be the last verse in a given chapter, and then it bleeds into the next chapter, and that's hard to read. So I identify, here's the beginning, and here's the end, and everything else in the middle is, is the middle, mm -hmm. most of the time. The Bible doesn't always follow that. Um, so that that's it came about because of these men, a uh, wonderful group uh, mm -hmm. that I, I've, I've got. We're in about six states now, and on Zoom, we do Zoom meetings. But uh, they they were the inspiration for this book. God worked through them. And I started putting all of my background together then on organization management and uh, research in particular, because I love researching the Bible. Right. And um, and I came up with this book. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm a secondary researcher. Primary researcher, I, I did that as a geologist. I would go out in the field and I would study things. I would draw maps. I would... You know, report back, write articles. That's primary, but mm. I'm not primary now. I've I'm taking the the work of other guys who are much smarter, mm. much more in depth than myself, and um, like N. T. Wright. If you're familiar with N. T. Wright mm. at all, uh, <laughs> you have to have a dictionary with you to, to listen <laughs> to N. T. Wright. But I love the guy, and and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take some of this really complex material, simplify it in such a way and to such a level that it makes sense to the person, the individuals. I have more, but I'll take a break. And no, no, on. absolutely. <laughs> well, you've accomplished your goals. I think your book does break down the Bible very effectively so people can understand it. I think your work of making it interactive, giving assignments and so forth, makes people contemplate about the Bible. Uh, the critical thinking aspects of retelling the story are great because uh, you really only understand something if you have to explain it to somebody else. So I think that is very, very worthwhile part of your book as well. I also found it interesting in your book. You know, I was raised Catholic. I went to Catholic grammar school, high school, and college, Jesuits in college. You know how much time was spent on the... Uh, Old Testament, I think, I, I don't think we learned anything about it. I mean, literally with every, every religion class I took dealt with the New Testament, which I understand we're Christians, we're starting with Christ, but right. I was always wondered, you know, what's up with the Old Testament? Is this really revelation like, you know, the New Testament? And so I think it's great that you started with Genesis through Ruth to help Christians understand the importance of the Old Testament as well. Absolutely. The, the Old Testament to me is beautiful. I just love the Old Testament. It is so rich in God's love. And so many people say, oh, this was a hateful God. This mm -hmm. is a mean God. And they think of retribution. You know, if I do bad, he hits me. If I do good, he blesses me. That's not really the kind of God we've got. God is love no matter what. And the Old Testament shows you that over and over and over and over again. 
Now, another thing, speaking of the Old Testament, you know, time between the beginning of the Bible with, with uh, the in the beginning up to uh, Abraham is kind of lost. We know there was a flood in there. We know there was a uh, Tower of Babel, which is a ziggurat. You look that up, ziggurat. It looks like a temple, but it's a, um, a uh, place to worship God where God comes down and is, is present. But uh, what we don't realize, and this is the other key thing I did with my men, was uh, I brought history in starting with the Ebla tablets. And if you've heard of the Ebla tablets, they were discovered somewhere around, uh, let's see, they were discovered about 1956 or 65, I think it was, um, in Ebla, Syria. But they cover their, their records that were beautifully, beautifully um, preserved in the palace library in Ebla. It burned down. The, the whole city was destroyed. But they had these clay tablets on wooden shelves, wooden bookshelves. Well, the fire was so intense that it burned the wood very quickly. The tablets fell not very far, but right on top of each other. And the ashes covered the tablets and preserved them. Mm. There's something like 1,900 perfectly preserved tablets. And there are over 4,000 partial pieces. And, and, and uh, it, it's just, it's amazing what is preserved. What that shows you when you read the data in there, it's like it's like going into a library or or the records area of the state government. Mm -hmm. You have marriage licenses, you have land licenses, you have corporations, literally corporations of trade. We're talking twenty five hundred BC. Mm -hmm. Twenty five hundred BC. Abraham wasn't born until 2200. Right. So Ebla, these people were very sophisticated. And, and that's what we need to understand. We People pick up the Bible and think, oh, I can't relate to these people. They, they were just a bunch of shepherds, uh, you know, wandering around. You can trace the power. And, and again, in the, in the next book, I do this, the next volume. You can, you can trace the power along the, the, uh, trade routes of commerce uh, in the Middle East. And you can see the power changes by who controls the trade routes. And I get into stuff like this because I love it. It makes it real. It becomes relevant to us because we can relate to that. They are people just like us. They were people just like us. Absolutely. And on the Christian versus the Old Testament, mm -hmm. We as Christians have almost forgotten that we are not divine. Mm. We are the branch. We are the branch and we are privileged to be the branch that was grafted in to the vine. And as Paul says to the Romans, we can just as easily be taken out. And, and I, have, I have numerous Jewish contacts that I run my materials by for the Old Testament. Hmm. I want their perspectives. I have interlinear Hebrew. And the, the original language of Hebrew, some of the things are much more moving. You know, you hear the message all the time that you have all of these idols, and therefore, as God, I am offended uh, because you worship these other idols. Well, in the Hebrew... I looked at that in Hosea, Hosea, where that's the one where the the man marry the prophet has to marry a prostitute. That's only the first three chapters. The last eleven chapters in that book are God pouring His heart out about how grieved He is, and He says, "You carve an image, just an object, with your hands. You hold it in your hands." 
You put it in front of your face, you look at it, and you say, you are my God. That is a lot more to the point mm -hmm. than saying, oh, you guys are worshiping idols. Right. No, you are my God, not God. You are my God, this thing I made. That, that is the kind of clarity that I want to bring in Scripture. And I thank God he's given me the, the research background and the contacts that that I can that I can do this. I I am blessed and I just want to spread it to everybody else that I can. Well, you're doing it. It's a wonderful book. It's the first in a series. It's called Get a Grip on the Bible, a study guide, Genesis through Ruth. More installments are coming, obviously, as we work our way through the Bible. It is written by Jerry L. Burton. It is a wonderful read. It will help you understand the Bible, see the Bible, contemplate the Bible in ways you hadn't before. And that is the work of a great writer and a great researcher as well. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan. You have a really blessed day. You too. God bless. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.